there we go. Now you can see me up on the screen. How's it going, everybody? Uh, for those of you that are watching out there, the camera's over here for all the folks that are out there in Twitch. How you doing? My name's Jeff Fritz. I'm back again, second stream of the day. Today is December 5th, 2019. I'm here in Arizona at the combined holiday party for what is the name of this new user group? Northwest Valley.net user group and southeastvalley.net user group. Too quiet, I'm sorry. I've pumped this up as loud as I can. It's not letting me go any louder. Um, let me see if I can just adjust one second. My apologies here to the folks in the room. Uh, there it is. My microphone. Let me see if I can push the microphone just a little bit louder. It always, this happens when, um, whenever you start changing things up. Right, things were working just fine for us a little bit ago. Now, not so much. My mic is not running on too sharp. It's actually wireless, and it's plugged in down here. And I'm not getting, this is the exact same mic I was using earlier today. It's not the connection there. Um, let me check one more thing before I get started. I'm so sorry. My apologies. Sounds like the microphone is in the room next door. Yeah, I'm trying here, friends. Um, let's see. Yeah. So, and the folks here saw I had everything running. It's not showing. No, sorry, I don't have the settings set up right either for folks to run funny sound effects. Test, test, test. This should go, how's that? Too loud now. Test, there we go, that's a lot better. All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about tonight. There we go. So this will all be recorded, this will all be available on the Twitch channel, we'll send it over to my YouTube channel. You can see all the links, all the information here in the room. You can find that at C Sharp Fritz, youtube.com slash C Sharp Fritz, twitch.tv slash C Sharp Fritz, and you can learn more about what we're gonna talk about today with full stack development with ASP.NET Core. All right, let's do this. Let's talk about ASP.NET Core. Those of you, there are about half the room here, and there's, in, in chat room, you know there's thousands and thousands of people here at Carvana in Arizona. It's true, I wouldn't lie about this. You know that ASP.NET Core is open source. It's cross-platform. It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And um, I, I love the keyword here. It's blazingly fast. Uh, it, marketing had some fun with that um, because that's a reference to our new, uh, our new user interface framework called Blazor. It is blazingly fast. It's the fastest commercially supported framework that's available. We released .NET Core 3 at .NET Conf. That was our virtual conference we hosted Back in September, um, .NET Core 3 has WPF and Windows Forms support. So you can build your desktop apps with .NET Core um, and deploy them anywhere now on Windows. Really great stuff. Side-by-side -side support, you've already had that with ASP.NET Core, right? This is something we've fought with for years with .NET Framework. You had to have the right version of .NET Framework on your machine so that you could deploy an application because if, it, if you built for .NET 461 and somebody else built for .NET 4.8, you can't you can't really work the two of them on the same machine together very well. Well, with .NET Core, you can take your framework with you and put it in the same folder. You can do that with .NET Core 3 in your WPF and Windows Forms application. Full stack web development with C Sharp and Razor, that's a hint to the Blazor framework that we now have available. And C Sharp 8, new language features in there as well. Thousands of people says boom boom about the chat room, yes. Legendary Moon, yeah, you see what I did there? Lots and lots of good stuff coming. You can get your hands on .NET Core 3 at .NET slash get core 3, but there's a new version anyway, so we'll talk about that as well. I mentioned that it's really, really fast. Check it out. This is the Tech Empower Benchmarks, right? We like to go back to this. This is an independent organization that is talking about measuring the performance of web frameworks. And in the top 10 frameworks, we have these other ones here that are ULib, ULib, Plain Text, Wizardo, LibReactor. Uh, and I'll point out these first couple 
you're programming in C++ to build a web application. If you're programming in C++ to build a web application, you're gonna be allocating and releasing memory like crazy. I, I don't know about you, but that's not something that I want to be thinking about while I'm building a web application. If I'm working that low level, I better be running really, really fast. Java, C, Rust, but C Sharp and ASP.NET Core, this is the first commercial, commercially supported frameworks that you can get at number eight and number nine, almost seven million requests a second with just the base plain text benchmarks coming through. That's huge, right? Seven million requests a second. Um, if, if that's a problem for you, you, you've got other problems. If seven million requests is too slow for you. So, um, now the performance improvements really, when you see between 2.2 and 3.0, you see this massive jump. That plain text benchmark that's here on the left, we went from 2.6 million requests per second using what we call middleware, right? We've done middleware with ASP.NET Core. That's where we intercept uh, the actual request pipeline and we do interactions there. We went from 2.6 million requests to 3.2 million requests per second. Time to first, re uh, first request, we cut in half and we cut the memory footprint. Look at that. We went from almost a gig when it's fully running to 57 meg. 57 meg. That's how much more space for you to build your application. And you see similar drop off in the amount of memory being used in these other benchmarks. The JSON benchmarks, whether it's with middleware or, with the, it, or it's with an MVC controller, you see the, a similar improvement because we now have our new JSON serializer that we've built that takes, advantages, takes advantage of the new span of T and memory of T constructs that we have available. So we're not double allocating memory for stream and all the processing that goes with that. We don't have to clean that up and garbage collect it runs much, much more efficiently using those memory pointers. Really great stuff. We're really happy to see these performance improvements and there's even more still coming as we get into the new versions of the frameworks. We're not stopping with the performance here. We're gonna continue to squeeze the performance we can out of this. All right, just keeping an eye on folks in chat, make sure there aren't any questions. So I mentioned those improvements came from reducing the allocations, no allocations at all in that plain text. Um, the new system text JSON serializer, tiered compilation. So we don't compile everything or wait for, we don't compile everything up front and we don't wait for everything uh, to be just in time compiled when you request it, right? I mean, nobody liked that with web forms back in the day when you had to wait for every page to be compiled the first time through the application. That was a pain in the neck. So now, we'll do this tiered compilation where we'll, we'll prep those first couple pages that we think people are gonna request. Get that first request all set up and cached so you can get better performance. And better uh, garbage collection memory reservation default. So it is a full stack solution with ASP.NET Core 3. Um, the front end, of course, you're gonna build in the cloud with ASP.NET Core and you have your choice of user interface frameworks. You could build with MVC and Razor Pages. You could build web APIs that respond um, Signal R, right? You get that two-way live communication that uses WebSockets or other technology that gives you that live interaction. Or, uh, and we've also got security and identity features available for you. So that's pretty cool. But if you want to build for the client, typically you would have to go with JavaScript. Well now, now you can build with Blazor. And Blazor is our new user interface technology that it can run in the browser, it can run on the server, but it's this component-based framework. It's a throwback to where we were with web forms, where you have components that you can compose and you can reuse. And we're gonna see a little bit more um, about how that works in a little bit in our first demo here. But you also get that spa-like feel that you have with JavaScript, that single page application. You can build that now with Blazor, run it in the browser, run it in the server, and you get a really nice application experience. Now we've also got for backend processing, and my camera's kind of cutting it off, we've got worker service templates, and that's what's hiding behind the worker there. Worker service templates, and we have gRPC templates. So is anybody using, looking in the gRPC here in the room? One or two people, okay, eh, not too many. So gRPC is a way for you to get really, really thin communications and standardized communications across a whole bunch of different frameworks and platforms not just .NET, it's also gonna run with Java, with JavaScript, uh, Python, PHP, it's available on all these other frameworks. So you can have a 
um, a unified client experience, no matter which type of server you go to, and you want to make those remote procedure calls. Great stuff, and those worker service templates will give you that same look and feel that you have with your ASP.NET Core application. It's a console looking app that you can um, build your endpoints on. You can build your application services inside of and deploy those inside of containers or even as Windows services or System D services on various platforms. Um, in the chat room, Stelzi says, so with all these thousands of, of people that will surely follow now, there will be a 12 hour code party. Uh, referring to the, uh, right, you can see it just below me here. Um, no, no, sorry, Stelzi. Uh, the folks here in the room, they're, they're, they're not clicking through and following, it's okay. So, um, how do you get started with ASP.NET Core and .NET Core 3. Whatever, right? 3.0, 3.1, it's the same experience. You can download and install the .NET Core 3.1 SDK from .NET, and you can install your choice of Visual Studio 2019 for your, well, not just Visual Studio 2019, but your favorite Visual Studio for your platform of choice, whether you want to install Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio for Mac, or Visual Studio 2019, they all support ASP.NET Core 3.1 and 3.0, and you can get that from visualstudio.com. So let's talk about what Blazor is for a minute, because that's our first really exciting thing that, that I want to show you. So when we typically think of how you interact with the web, it looks kind of like this. You've got some sort of servers that are sitting behind the cloud, maybe they're sitting on a cloud, um, and you're gonna make a request from your browser to those servers, and it's gonna return some data and paint content in the browser. Well, we know that you can build with ASP.NET on the server and render all your HTML, all your content, and ship it down to the browser. But folks are now building more and more with .NET here. They're building APIs, they're building gRPC endpoints, so they can reach in and communicate with them using JavaScript, whether it's your favorite framework, Angular, React, Vue, and communicate and interact with .NET, and that's great. That, that is a phenomenal scenario that we know folks enjoy, and we wanna make sure that you can continue to enjoy using that front end framework. But we wanna suggest now that with the advent of WebAssembly, you can now use Blazor. So Blazor, uh, go back one. So Blazor will allow you to build and run in the browser native code that will execute and have all of its DLLs, all the things it needs to run sitting there in the browser and give you that same spa-like experience. What does that mean? So that means that you can write reusable web UI components with C Sharp and Razor. And if you've been building with ASP.NET MVC and ASP.NET Core MVC, you're very familiar with C Sharp and Razor. Write your markup, write your C Sharp, you can in intertwine those however you'd like and deliver some sort of a user interface using those standard web technologies. Because Blazor can run both on the client and on the server, you can share your .NET code across both endpoints. And if you need to, if you really want to use some of those JavaScript APIs, you want to interact with the DOM, you can do that. We have a full JavaScript interop story that's available for you so that you can call from .NET into JavaScript and from JavaScript into .NET and get a very low latency experience with that interaction. So you can find out more about that if you want to dig into it further at blazor.net. So I mentioned it runs on the client or the server. When we run Blazor WebAssembly over here, what we're gonna deliver into the browser, not only are we gonna deliver an HTML document object model, but we're also gonna deliver our Blazor application. Now that means it's gonna run on top of WebAssembly, and WebAssembly is an HTML5 standard. Anybody remember Spectre and Meltdown? You remember that flaw that we had a couple years ago? I see a couple folks nodding and, and some folks kind of grimacing, yeah, that was a pain in the neck. I don't know about you, but I had to go over to my mother-in-law's house and help with the patches on Windows and make sure that everything worked. But the point is, everybody had to upgrade their machines. Everybody had to upgrade their operating systems and their browsers. And I'm not just talking about their laptops or their desktops, but your phones also. That means that everybody now has support for HTML5. And this is a standard that's part of that. So everybody can run WebAssembly. What we've done is we've built a version of Mono that runs on top of WebAssembly. And that mono runtime that you see here, that .NET runtime, you can now build your Razor components 
to run on top of, and that's Laser. So we'll ship that little mono runtime to run in the browser and your application, and everything will just work in the browser. That's pretty cool. But if you want to run on the server, right, because there's reasons you may want to run on the server. Maybe you don't want your entire application sitting out there inside of someone's browser. Maybe you want to take a little bit more control over it. Maybe you have a, a, a not as much bandwidth to communicate with those folks. Maybe they're in a low bandwidth area, remote area. Maybe they're in Australia or someplace where they don't have quite the connection. Well, you can run server side where you'll have the DOM right here above me on the browser that makes a connection out to your server and all of the Blazor Razor components, all of the Razor components will run on top of the .NET runtime on the server and send back and forth across that this signal R channel that you see right here, just the changes to the user interface. Remember back in the day with web forms, we had that, that Ajax panel. Anybody remember the Ajax panel in web forms? Okay, I'm, and I'm seeing folks in the back saying, oh my gosh, yes. So, Right, that was really cool because when you pressed a button or you hit a drop down box inside that panel, you had this little square of functionality that it would refresh whenever there was a post back event, right? You know, I see folks nodding, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, you get that same thing now automated for the entire Blazor application going across the Signal R channel, we call it, back and forth to the server. So the server maintains state for the application and you're able to push just those changes back and forth. Let the server do all the processing and send down just the user interface changes. And that's a framework, that's a technology that we're used to seeing as ASP.NET developers. So we feel kind of comfortable with that. Now, we shipped Blazor server side with .NET Core 3.0, look at that, pointing right at it. And uh, Blazor WebAssembly is available in preview now. We expect to ship that in the spring there might be a Microsoft conference in the spring that we might be building towards that we might announce that. I'm not, I'm not saying, but there could be a thing there that happens uh, later in the spring. So, Blazor WebAssembly, great for offline support, progressive web apps, zero latency UI because you're shipping all the DLL down into the browser, everything that you need to run it. This also means you can have static website hosting. A Blazor WebAssembly application, short of the APIs that you're going to use to actually update things, you can run everything from a static website host. That's, that's pretty cool. That means, right, zero processing cost to run that. Blazor server side, though, is great if you have a thin client and you want the full .NET Core runtime and you want all of your code to run on the server. Maybe you've got some various security things that you want to make sure only run in secured servers that are audited and whatnot, you can do that with Blazor server side. In the chat room, Legendary Moo says, way to build up. Yeah, I'm building up anticipation for, the, uh, for that conference in the spring. Thank you, Legendary Moo in the chat room. All right, so let me talk about, I've talked about Blazor enough. Let's actually take a look at it. Let's actually build a little bit of Blazor here. Let me do a little live coding for you. This is one of the things that I enjoy doing on Twitch is writing some code, answering your questions live as we're writing a little bit of an application here on the screen. So let me start up. This is Visual Studio 2019. I always run the preview versions. There's a preview track and there's also a, an RTM track. You have your choice of the two different versions you want to run. And I'm gonna create a new project here. These run always side by side and I'm gonna build a Blazor app. There it is right there. And we'll call this Blazor App 8 because the first seven weren't good enough for you. I'm making an eighth. Um, so this is Blazor Server App. There we go. And it's going to generate the template and things for me. Write that down to disk. And there we go. So now when we look at this application over here, right, and the folks in the chat room, you've on Twitch, you've seen me build and work with Blazor applications for the last, uh, last month or two. When you look at this, I have a program class that looks just like ASP.NET Core that it's starting up and it's building a web host. I have a startup class that has everything I need to start a web server. I have Razor pages I'm gonna host. I'm adding all my server-side Blazor capabilities. 
um, I'm adding a service that I'm going to reference inside my application, and I configure my HTTP pipeline, just like I do in ASP.NET Core. And uh, you can see HTTPS redirection, static files, routing, and there's an additional endpoint here for Map Blazor Hub. This is that SignalR hub that's gonna give you that two-way communication automatically back and forth to the server. So that's pretty cool. That's something that, uh, that we don't have to think about and it'll just make a very easy to use application, very low latency application. Chat, you just gotta shout out, you're famous now. Describe, <laughs> I see, they're having fun in the chat room. Um, all right, so let me go over and show you, I have pages here and these are various things that are not too hard to kind of understand. I have an index page, hello world. I have a counter, and this looks like razor markup, right? I've got, uh, I've got this page directive up here, more on that in a second, but in H1, a paragraph, and I'm outputting the value of a C-sharp field here called current count. I have a button that has an on click here, but it has an, an at sign in front of it. That flips it from being a JavaScript on click to being a .NET on click, and this increment count is actually .NET code written here. So I can execute .NET code from a button click in HTML. Let me run this and show you how this works. The, the page here, this is a directive that tells you, that tells this component, you're gonna answer on the slash counter page. Let me, let me show you what happens here when we start this. Uh, this one. I'm trying to get this to run. Oh, come on, you're, you're killing me here. There we go. I want this to run without the debugger attached. There we go, so there's my hello world. And check out over here in my network tab. Let me refresh the screen again. So look, localhost, bootstrap main, I've got 304s coming through for things, right? Some images, some JavaScript, and this is server side, and it does a WebSocket connection here, and I get a 101, and you can see messages that have been sent back and forth to the server. So if I click here to pull down my dropdown, I've got a bunch of messages that went back and forth. Check this out. This is, this is kind of ingenious what happens here, right? Dispatch browser event, browser renderer, event handle, ID, event args, mouse, event field info type, it was a click. And here's where on the screen I clicked. And you barely can't see it behind my noggin here, I'm sorry, let me move this over. Let me move that over so you can see what's going on here. There we go, that's a little bit better. So you can see screen X, screen Y, you can see exactly where I clicked, client X, cloud, client Y where I clicked on that button and it sent back, right, look at this. It's, so I received back JS render batch and it told me to put a class on something here, right? You don't have to worry about any of this network traffic going back and forth and how to translate it, right? On render completed, so it finished applying that. This is all being done for you so that you end up with a very fast and small application that runs, right? I'm not actually loading any more content here when I click back and forth between these, right? It's just repainting with the content coming across that WebSocket. And when I click this, right, I'm not getting anything repainting, it just increments, just like you would expect to see if this was, I'm gonna say it, chat room, if this was JavaScript. I have a thing on Twitch when I say JavaScript, Horses neigh in the background like what Frau Blucher goes, never mind. That's a thing, so. No more writing JavaScript, they love it in the chat room. All right, yeah, and they're trying to execute my JavaScript commands where you can hear the horses go running. Because we horse around with JavaScript a little bit. So, okay, I've got a counter, I've got this little thing that fetches data from the server and paints on here um, to demonstrate how an API works. Let's, let's get in, let's talk to, about what this means that this is a component, right? This is counter.razor here, and it's, it's a component that has this page directive up here. That is where it answers. When I navigate to, you can see it down here, right? If I zoom in a little bit and go down, 
to the bottom. I'm not going to be able to show both, am I? Um, you can see it's going to blah, 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 slash counter down there. And it takes me to that location. But it's, right, it's a fake thing here that this is specifying where it lives. I can even get rid of this. Save. And now the server's refreshing. So we're going to see it refresh. And when I try and go to slash counter, there's nothing at this address because this component doesn't know to answer at slash counter. So I can build out a routing table and specify where these things listen just by adding this page directive to the top of my dot razor files. So that's kind of neat, right? And there it is back again. But these are components that I can reference inside of other pages, right? They're, we can compose bigger user interfaces. So if I come down here, I can start typing counter there, right? And now my counter component will be included on my index page, right? I'll refresh. So there's my counter at slash counter. If I go to home, now my counter is over here also. And these are two different counters behaving independently of each other. So now I have a concept of I can build something that looks like a page, but I can reference and include inside of other things. That's pretty interesting. That's something that, that we can do some interesting things with. The chat room, uh, there's Barry asking, what renders that 404 page? So when I removed that counter, the, I'm sorry, not that one. When I was over here and I removed this, so that will reload. There it is. So it's still a component, so I still get it on this page, but when I come over here, sorry, there's nothing at this address. There's a router that's defined. I believe it's up here. There we go. So we have a router defined that takes a look and it tries to find all the various routes that are available. If it can't find the route to go to, right now it just outputs this, this paragraph. But you can have that route and go to different places and output different things if there's an error or something. You have that freedom to change the way this appears by manipulating this app.razor where our router is defined. Thanks for the question. Appreciate that. So, and if, and if anybody wants to ask any other questions, please drop a message in the chat room. I'm keeping an eye there. And here in the room, if you don't want to drop a message in the chat room, you can raise your hand. I'm happy to come to it. Um, we've got plenty of time here together. The folks at Carvana aren't doing anything. Maybe they are. They're working. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any other questions as we go along. So let me go over to this index page. The, the application that I like to build for this demo is actually a currency converter, right? So when we think about a currency converter, you've got a couple of fields. Let me clear this out, right? And um, we specify our C-sharp code in line with our template here in this at code block. And I can now define the different fields that I want to work with. So um, I'm going to have a currency that I'm going to convert uh, from. Let me call this from currency. Right? Uh, start it like that. Let's just do that. Um, and I'm going to convert to a diff uh, some other currency. And I'm going to have a v initial value, right, that I'm going to uh, have. So from value, I'll have a value that I'm going to convert to. So we'll call to value. And that's not bad. Those are some initial values that we could start with. Um, and the user interface that I want to build to go with that, uh, let's see, let's put an H2 here and call this uh, Fritz's Currency Converter. And I can put an input box here. And I want to have this input box be the number that we're going to key in. So I'm going to at bind, I'm going to say, take the contents of this and we're going to bind it to the from value, okay? So it knows that this is a C-sharp value and it matches up to that. And I need to specify the type of currency. Well, hang on, let's, we're gonna convert from one value to another value, so let's do that. And we'll put a hyphen here, something like this. So we'll have some sort of a select that says, um, well, we'll have an option here or something like that. And we're gonna need to have a couple of currencies to convert between. So uh, let's create an array of currencies. Right? 
So we'll have a new string array, and we'll just convert between USD and Canadian, right? So let's put a quick for each here that says for each uh, currency in currency. See, it finds that collection there. I'm going to output an option, and I'm going to output the name of that currency. But if the from currency is the one that's selected, and I'm gonna, I see the comments there in the chat room. Oh my gosh, we're, uh, Kim Philpotts is, is rating us. All the friends from Kim Philpotts channel, thanks so much for joining us. Great to see you. My name's Jeff Fritz. I'm here in Arizona speaking at a combined user group meeting. I'll come to the chat room in just a minute. I'm writing a sample here to build a currency converter. Thanks so much for joining us. So um, if something is going to be selected, right, um, I want to make sure that, where is it? Where's my mouse, my cursor? It's somewhere in there. I want to say when from currency equals the currency that was selected. So when that's equal, selected will be true. When selected is false or null, outputted there, um, ASP.NET and Blazor knows, it, the Razor templating language actually, knows to drop that selected attribute altogether. So we'll only get an output there if it's true. So let me see here. I'm seeing a couple questions here. Um, yeah, sorry, I've turned off the alerts on, on the stream. How do you keep the same count in both counters? Asks um, the angel Lugo. Um, so when I had the current, that, that counter component that was in both places, what you can do is you can actually put um, a shared class into memory, in a static class into memory, or even into scope for the person that's requesting this, and put state inside of that class. And for those of you that have been doing ASP.NET for a really long time, that should sound curiously like session state or application state, because it is. We are doing the exact same thing again. It's coming back. So Kim Philpot says, sorry, didn't realize you're giving a session. That's okay, Kim. I appreciate you sending folks over here to join us, and, and I'm happy to take their questions as well um, as we're going along here. Thank you for the subs. Um, when folks subscribe to my channel um, and they cheer just for the folks here in the room, I make a donation to charitable causes. Back in, the, that's the sub, or you have a question? Sure. Oh my gosh, really great question. Let me just finish saying that whenever I have subscriptions or cheers, we make a donation. This quarter we're donating to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. The question that we have here in the room is, what if we got this list of currencies from, from a database or from sort of a, some sort of a service, maybe, a, maybe an international banking organization? Spoiler alert, that's the next demo. <laughs> Love the enthusiasm, that's exactly where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're going to do exactly that. Kim Philpotts, thanks so much for the sub. Appreciate that. All right, so I'm just outputting this, and I'm going to do the exact same thing for this select, and I, I actually need to bind this value as well. I'm going to bind this to my from currency. There it is, there. And I want to have this exact same experience for the select, but for my to currency that I'm going to convert to, right? We'll put that right here. And instead of binding to from currency, we'll bind to to currency. And we'll just change this to to currency. So that is output there. And we're going to need a button to actually do the calculation. So we'll put a button here and we'll say convert. And um, we'll need a method to do that conversion, won't we? So let's write a quick method. Um, void convert. And we want this to call that, so I will say, I could say on click, but you can see um, it wants to do that on client side, but I will change that and make it at on click. So it does server side, it does uh, .NET code, and I'm gonna have it call convert. Since there's no arguments being passed in, I can just give it the name of the method. So now to convert, um, okay, well I'm gonna have some sort of a rate, and let's have that rate start as uh, 1.0, right? Um, so let's see, how can we do this? If, um, if from currency equals to currency, well, it's gonna be 1.0, so, uh, let me just write that again here. 
rate equals 1.0, do it like that. Else if uh, from currency equals, uh, if it's USD, then we're converting from USD to, um, to Canadian. So it's, uh, it's roughly 1.3, right? Something like that, right? So we'll say rate equals 1.3. Um, otherwise, if the two currency uh, is Canadian, right, let's say the rate is uh, 0 .0 0 0.7, 0 0.72, something like that. Sounds good, right? Nobody's Canadian in the room, right? Nobody's Canadian watching. Actually, Kim's not Canadian. No, we're good. So, right, so we've got our rate calculated, and that'll, that'll work out there. Close enough of the web face. Yeah, that's close enough. Um, all right, so I have my rate, and I want to calculate and put the result in the other box. So I'm just going to say to value equals from value times rate. That's easy, right? So I should be able to go back over to my browser now, refresh, and get that user interface loaded for me if I did everything properly. It's actually over on the home page. There we go. So I've got, I've got my currencies in these. If I key in something here, let's say that that's one US dollar, and we click to convert, it's, well, it's not Canadian. I didn't select Canadian there. Um, but if I tell it to go to US, it goes back to 1.0. If I change this to Canadian to convert to US, um, did I do that wrong? If currency equals this, rate is 0.72 from value, two value equals from value times rate. I missed something, didn't I? What did I do wrong? If from currency equals to currency. Uh, thank you. It's the same. So I'll refresh. See that live coding. We've got all of our friends here helping us out. And boom, boom, in the chat room identified it as well. Look at that. So I changed this to Canadian, convert to US, and it works. Simple, right? So we built a, very quickly here a, a simple user interface that has um, it has events, it's got uh, the ability to track and update my user interface. I'm binding two-way binding values back and forth, and I'm using stuff that feels and looks like your typical Razor templating. I think that's a pretty, pretty good sample. There's a question here in the room, yeah. If, if, if we wanted to debug that, how would we do that? Um, I would put a breakpoint right here and I can kick it off, and it will attach to the debugger, and it will step through and catch that. So with Visual Studio 2019, I don't know if we have it running in Visual Studio code yet, but if I set this and do something over here, something like this, and I hit the debugger. So you can debug. I was only keeping the debugger detached so I could get a quick refresh experience, but good question. Thank you so much. There is a Canadian listening, says angry little hamster. I love the handles in Twitch. Thank you, angry little hamster. Canadian citizen, Canadian nature is questionable, but oh, man. Now I can't make any Canadian jokes. I'm sorry. All right, so that's a little bit about Blazor, and that's running server side. Has anybody seen Blazor run client side? Do you want me to show that real quick? Take, all right, let's take a quick look at what Blazor client side looks like. I'm gonna start a new project, and I'm, it's gonna be the exact same template, but I want you to see the interaction between, this is Blazor App 9. I want you to see the interactions that are delivered over the network for this. So I can choose Blazor WebAssembly, and this will generate and um, allow me to start working here, yes. All right, so when you look at this Solution Explorer, it looks very similar to what we saw in the server side version of the application. I've got a program class, I've got a startup class. I have pages here, counter fetch data index dot razor. These components, you can build, put them in a class library and reference and use them across both versions, server side and WebAssembly of Blazor. And the content is the same. Counter, right, and I've got the same increment count. It's a button with an on click. This is pretty standard and in fact, this Blazor client side compiled to .NET Standard 2.1. So we can build with Blazor WebAssembly 
and it will run on runtimes that support .NET Standard 2.1. That means the mono WebAssembly that's available, and it also means .NET Core 3.1 will run this, okay? Let me show you what it looks like when we actually launch this inside the browser so we can take a look at uh, the network traffic that goes back and forth here. The, the rest of the code is very much the same. There's a little bit of differences in the startup that defines how it compiles and outputs um, the interactions here. So there's my browser. Let me open up the network traffic here. Let me do a hard refresh. Okay, so loading and there's my entire page. Check out what it delivers. So localhost, there's some initial HTML. Bootstrap, yeah, we know Bootstrap, some site CSS. But here's the first, the first thing that looks a little bit different. Blazor WebAssembly JavaScript. This is what's gonna bootstrap and load up all the things for WebAssembly to run in our browser. Blazor boot JSON, that's some information to get the framework running. Mono.js, so that's some JavaScript that'll trigger the Mono framework. There's Mono compiled for WebAssembly. And when I click into this, it, it delivered a 304. It's already cached on my machine. But the size of this, where is it? The size is here somewhere. The full size of it. It's not gonna show it to me, is it? The full size of everything that I've requested, not just mono, but all these other, look at these, these are DLLs that it's delivering, is only five meg. Now when you think about that compared to some of the larger, unoptimized uh, JavaScript frameworks, that's not too bad. It's not great, but it's not too bad, right? We can stomach five meg going across a high speed network, but these are DLLs that we're shipping down and that run inside the browser sandbox. And when I click and interact here, there's no additional interaction that happens. There's no, uh, there's no WebSocket, there's no interaction. All of this is now inside the browser. I requested from an API endpoint some JSON, right? When I look at the response there, you can see it's the same data that we painted here. And that just emulates what you would do if you were requesting data from an endpoint and painting it inside of your application. So not bad. This is something that I think we can, we can sink our teeth into, build components for, and run it either server side or in WebAssembly, depending on your needs. And you'll have the flexibility to make that choice in the future. Cool, what do we think? Blazor, WebAssembly, server side, pretty good? Okay, I don't know, you, you can't hear them. The microphone isn't too good picking this up here, chat room. But it was thunderous applause here. <laughs> thunderous, all right? Trust me on this. Never mind. Um, all right. So let's close out of this and let's go back over to here. Let's talk about, yes, we did the Blazor demo. So when you run Blazor server side, and this is the version that, is, that we support right now. Blazor WebAssembly, like I said, not supported yet. We're still working on it. Um, we've tested for appropriate latency. So less than 200 milliseconds, right? Less than two tenths of a second. Under load with concurrent clients, we've gotten our standard one CPU, three and a half gigabyte machine in the cloud up to 5,000 concurrent active users. That's not bad. If you're building an intranet application, if you're building an, an internet application, that you're not gonna see a ton of users hitting, right? I mean, 5,000 is still a pretty good number, but that's concurrent 5,000 users. That's pretty good. If you push all the way to the D3 uh, version, you're gonna get four CPUs, 14 gig, and you get more than 20,000 users on there. But the catch here, is that state is managed in memory on these servers. If you're going to run more than one server so that you can have, uh, right, you can have, what is it, red-green deploys, right, or blue-green deploys, you're gonna need to manage state outside of process. Put it inside of a database, put it somewhere where you can continue to interact and have, um, have the, the experience continue outside of when that web server disappears and the other one takes over. Uh, but we're seeing right now memory is the, is the current bottleneck. And your real application behavior depends on how your application uses memory. Standard, disclaimer, blah, blah, blah. These are our benchmarks on a, on a basic application. Once you start building something more complex, your numbers may change. Um, in the chat room, the bald bearded builder, uh, that's our friend Michael Jolly, he's another gentleman who writes code here on Twitch. He writes, the biggest benefit I see with Blazor besides using C Sharp is the ease at which we can build progressive web apps with .NET. He's not wrong. That's a really good comment on this, being able to continue using your .NET experience and your, your 
desktop experience to build applications. Really great stuff. gRPC is the next thing we want to talk about. We built a template. We built the ability for you to um, interact with folks that use gRPC endpoints. Um, and you can do that from .NET with this, with this set of clients and services that we built for you. So you get this high performance contract based RPC services based on protocol buffers. Anybody use protocol buffers? One or two people. It's kind of a tricky little standard, but I, it, it works for me. It's, it's not too bad. Broad interoperability with polyglot environments. Yep, we've mentioned that. Great for service to service communication. Yeah, you're not delivering user interfaces with gRPC. This is something that's going to take, um, take advantage of the same space that we were in with uh, WCF. So we have a new template and we generate client code for you with our new gRPC features inside of ASP.NET Core. Let me show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna start a new project here and we're gonna look for the gRPC service, there it is. gRPC service six. We'll start this up, yep, I want the gRPC service template and it's gonna generate and put down this feature here, uh, sure, go ahead, close it, all right. So I have a definition for my service here using the protocol buffers syntax. So this is protocol, uh, proto three syntax and the name of, of this is gRPC service six. You can change that to whatever namespace you would like. We define a package called greet and we have a greeter service that has an endpoint that you can call a method called say hello. It takes a parameter called hello request and it's gonna return an output called hello reply. Hello request has a string with a name. Hello reply has a message string that it's gonna return. Now, we actually take this, this syntax, this format, and we turn this into a class for you that you can then wire up to, right? We take that greet and it turns into greeter base, right? So this we called service greeter and it turns into greeter base, okay? Now we take this and we extend it by overriding that say hello method and here's what we're going to do. Hello and whatever name was passed in. That's pretty garden variety, hello world types of things. This service looks and feels a bit like a, an API controller endpoint, right? Or an MVC controller method that's responding to an endpoint, but it's got all the bindings to gRPC because instead of implementing a, a controller, we implement this generated class for us. And if you don't believe me that it's generated, you can F12 into that to look at the details and, and you can see generated by the protocol buffer compiler, um, do not edit, right? And you can look through and see all this really ugly generated code. Don't touch this. This is gonna be rebuilt for you on the fly when your proto file changes. Um, all right, so continuing through here, let me show you in the startup file, instead of having all of the things needed to run ASP.NET Core and, and all the ASP.NET Core things, we're adding gRPC services into our dependency injection container. In our configure method, we set up routing and instead of having an endpoint for our MVC controllers, we map our gRPC service. And there's the name of our service. So I can add a client here, real easy, that'll consume this service. So let me add a new project. And I'm just gonna add a console project. Console app, there we go. Sure, console app one, we'll create that. And if I want this to consume that gRPC service, I can very easily say add service reference. Remember doing this back in Visual Studio years ago? And I could say add a new gRPC service reference the file that I want to run is actually um, up here over in this, and it's down under protos, there it is. So I'll choose that. The type of class to be generated, yep, generate the client. It's gonna install some NuGet packages into this client project, and we're going to get, good. Uh, ooh, save as changes, thank you. So now we have a greet proto here that we can interact with and have a client that we build and work with. Now, I've already written some source code to connect to that client and interact with it. Let me grab that real quick here. 
I don't see it. It's over here. Thank you. Do, 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 do. Um, there it is. So that you don't have to watch me type all of that. So static async task main, let me do a control dot on that, get some using statements in here. And control dot on this, get my using statements, there we go. So now, and we'll call this uh, Phoenix client, there we go. So now we're gonna connect out to address localhost 5001, create a client on that channel. Looks kind of like WCF, doesn't it? And I have say, uh, say hello async, just like it generated a method back in the, in the WCF days, passing in a hello request object, and we're gonna return the message that was returned. Easy, right? This kind of makes sense. I need to start these in a particular order here, so let me configure my application to have multiple startups, and I will start both of these. And when I click start, we should get two windows, two console windows started. So there's my console app, there's the gRPC service here. We should see this start and look like an ASP.NET app. And over here, we get our response. Simple, right? We haven't done anything really interesting or compelling here. We stood up a service that knows how to respond with a simple hello world, and we sent in a request to that. Now. What if we connected out to a bank service and provided those to our Blazor application, huh? That was, right, the, spoiler alert, here we go, let's go back into that. So um, I've already got the application updated with a gRPC service that gets the currency exchange rate from the European bank. And here's my service down here, currency exchange rate service, okay? and it knows how to get the rate from for the appropriate currency where we're gonna request the type from and the, cur the currency we're gonna convert to and we're gonna return that. We've also got a list of currencies that we're gonna get from this currency exchange rate object, which is a interface that knows how to connect out and get that information. And if I go in here, there it is. We're gonna go off of exchangeratesapi.io, and that's a open source service you can use that bounces off of a European bank to return the appropriate exchange rates. So let me show you, if I look back at my index here, I have a currency converter component, and it's over here. So I have the exact same thing here where I had selects with options, but instead of having that array here defined, I've set up a method that says, when we initialize this component, use my currency exchange rate client to go get the list of currencies and put that into the, the array of currencies here that we'll then use to update my select lists. When I click convert now, we're gonna get the rate for the from currency and to currency and do that calculation. Delegate everything over to that um, gRPC service to do that. All right, let me hit the button and show this actually working. So I went through and I retested this earlier. Where's Joe? I retested this earlier and it was working. So here's, I've got two browsers opening. There we go. So here's the gRPC service. You can't browse to it, but it's running over here in this browser. And here's my new Blazor server-side application, and check that out. One US dollar is 1.46 Australian dollars, right? And I can choose all kinds of currencies here. Is euros in this list? No, euros isn't in this list. Uh, I saw, right, Great British Pound, and it should do that conversion for me. There we go, 0.76 to go from US dollars to pound sterling. So, I'm looking, taking a look here, blah, 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 okay. So there you go, we've been able to move and still use Blazor, but we're connecting out using gRPC as a client inside Blazor to a server that's actually doing our calculations, all right? Think about it, you can put that inside of WebAssembly, right, inside of Blazor WebAssembly, so that you can also then do the same calculations 
off of that remote service, so you're not constantly downloading, here's my conversion table and putting it on everybody's machine. No need to do that. Still use the web service and just connect out for only that data you need. So that's gRPC and what's available with ASP.NET Core 3. Let me start this up and we'll go to worker services. So if you have an, an application service that you want to start, you don't necessarily want to host a web endpoint. You don't want to host ex exposed HTTP endpoints. You can run a, a worker service and listen to, say, a queue or monitor files on disks or monitor all kinds of stuff, whatever it might be. Maybe you've got a sensor you're monitoring. Well, you can use this template that looks like the same web service uh, application, web application, but it doesn't have the web host in it. It has all the other things, the logger, dependency injection, all that stuff. And you can compile and run this as a Windows service or as a system D service on Linux. And that's pretty interesting. So let me show you what that worker service template looks like. And I'm keeping an eye on my time. I got about 20 minutes left, right? We're, we need to get out of here at eight. Fantastic. We've, we've got this, made in the shade. So we'll do a new project here. And I'm going to choose worker service. I've already built it recently, so it's here on the left side. Worker service three, that sounds like a great name. There we go, worker service template. Generate some content, put it down on disk, restore my packages. Let's show you what this looks like now. So once again, just like in ASP.NET Core, I have a program class. Instead of having a web host builder, we just have a host builder. And that host builder, we configure services that are gonna run and we're adding one hosted service, in this case, called a worker. That worker, implements background service, receives an iLogger so we can log things out. And we could be logging to the console, but most likely we're gonna be logging to something like the Windows event log. So we're gonna be able to use that logger. And in the default template that we have here, it's just gonna output worker running at whatever the current time is and just write that out. And it'll write that every second. So nothing too big here. But I can run this and it runs like a console application and every second I get another entry popping out. Okay, big deal. If I want to run this as a Windows service, I have to add a little bit more code and install this as a service. So let me go over here. I can manage my NuGet packages. There it is. And if I choose to browse here, I'm gonna go grab not the system D one, Windows services, Microsoft extensions, hosting Windows services. If I install this, yes, I accept terms and services, blah, blah, blah. I can go into program now and I can say not just add host, uh, not just configure services, but I can say, uh, did I, I deleted an extra paren there, there it was. Um, use Windows service, and now when I compile this, I can install this as a Windows service and it'll behave and interact with Windows appropriately. So that's pretty impressive to be able to add in this, the, this ability to make this a Windows service. If I were to run this on Linux and use systemd, you saw the package pop up there briefly for me. So if I pull this down, there it is. Microsoft extensions hosting system D install this package and you have a very similar method that you can call and you'll be able to install and run this as a service on a Linux machine as well. So a lot of flexibility there with what you can do with worker services now and your right your worker service can do whatever you'd like in here. Maybe it's going to act as, as some sort of an application server that's going to send faxes. I don't know. Whatever you're you're gonna to listen to some sort of event and when that happens, go do something. You can do that all inside of this. All right, let me roll over and go back to the slides and talk about, let me see, how much time do we got? 15 minutes, plenty of time. SignalR got some great updates. We now have client to server streaming. So this means that you don't just have to make a request or, or send a message and wait for it to process. You can actually stream data 
between client and server. We've also now got auto reconnect capability, and that kind of makes sense. If we've got something that's a live connection, as we do with SignalR, if we have a live connection from this endpoint to that endpoint, and something happens and it breaks, you don't want to have to think about getting it to reconnect. When the connection's available again, reconnect, darn it. And we've also got C-sharp 8 and I async enumerable support. So you can send messages and, right, you, you can wait while it's delivering each of the items in that collection. So let me show you, I forgot to go over here. Let me show you a quick demo on SignalR streaming with auto reconnect capabilities. And it is, here it is, real time timer. This is my demo, there we go. So I have a streaming timer hub, right? This looks just like an, a SignalR hub. Um, I can write data asynchronously to my various clients and we're going to write asynchronously to any connected client the current time all the way down to fractions of a second every 10 milliseconds. So it's just gonna go through this loop and send that data. Inside of my application, I've got this JavaScript and they're gonna try and make those horses run here. Um, and we're gonna make a connection, we're used to seeing this, make a connection with our JavaScript uh, libraries out to our hub. We're going to the streaming, streaming time hub right here. Um, automatic reconnect, and we're gonna try to connect and start streaming that data. When we start streaming data, we're gonna listen for a stream called server timer, and we're going to appropriately set the inner text to whatever time we receive, okay? So let's do this. Let's actually start outputting and seeing what this looks like. Now I'm gonna run this without the debugger attached because I'm gonna kill it and get it to reconnect so you can see just how quickly it'll reconnect to us here. So there it is running, right? And let me zoom in. So it's a little bit easier to see, there we go. So it, right, it's streaming those values and it's just repainting the screen as they happen. And that's streaming data with signal R. Now that's, not very impressive, right? I mean, big deal, you're sending the time down and updating it on the screen, Jeff, I mean, really? So let me refresh and you can see there's the WebSocket connection right there. I wanna show you the console, right? When this gets disconnected, because I'm gonna go down here, you can't, you can't see it behind my noggin here, but I'm going to go to my real time timer here and I'm gonna kill this and you see it stops, I'm gonna restart it real quick. So there's another one. But over here, you can see the one that I stopped is gonna to try to reconnect, and we'll see it attempt to reconnect in just a second. There's a default back off that it hits. It's like 10 seconds, then 30 seconds, two seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, I think it is, and it will reconnect, and now I'm streaming data again. This is pretty good. Right, because now, now your SignalR connections are much more dependable. Now you're gonna be able to uh, rely on the fact that you're always connected to that SignalR endpoint. And streaming data looks pretty impressive, the way it comes through. Now that could be images, that could be video that you're streaming with SignalR down to your clients. We think that's uh, pretty valuable for folks to be able to use. So that's what's going on with SignalR. Yes, stop all those processes. All right, let me go back over here. So the ASP.NET Core features that we deliver with .NET Core 3, Blazor server side, gRPC worker services, there's even open API client code generation if you like open API for your interaction with your web services. You, I showed you SignalR auto reconnect and streaming, Angular 8 and React 16 templates, those are available for you now. We now support SPA authentication for those frameworks. Really great stuff to see. Um, certificate Kerberos authentication, HTTP2 by default. Look at that right there, that's pretty good. Um, event counters, system text JSON integration, you're gonna get that performance bump because you're seeing no memory allocation for the JSON manipul string manipulation. There's all kinds of information um, available on the release notes. If you go to docsmicrosoft.com, ASP.NET Core release notes, and you'll see ASP.NET Core 3 out there. 
But .NET Core 3.1 was just released this week. This week. And I'm here talking about it. Long-term support is available with this one. Bug fixes, stability improvements, and a couple of, couple of little updates that came along the way. Nothing too major that you're going to see. But ASP.NET Core now has, you, you saw I had all my code for Blazor sitting in one file, that Razor template. We now support using partial classes to build those components. Partial classes to build user interface frameworks with ASP.NET, do tell. Right, we remember .aspx.cs files laying around, right? Yeah. yeah. That used to be a thing, well you can do it again. Um, you can pass parameters into the top level of those components, and you can actually do that with web forms in ASP.NET 4.7.1 and later. You can do that as well. <laughs> um, prevent default actions in Blazor apps, right? We always have the event prevent default in JavaScript when you're doing a button click and that kind of thing. You can do that now with Blazor. Um, a component tag helper, so you can use your Razor components that you would use for Blazor inside of Razor pages or inside of MV MVC views. So you can reuse your components everywhere now in ASP.NET. Better detailed errors during Blazor app development and support for shared queues on the HTTP sys server. Not a lot of folks use the HTTP sys server, but that's available. Let me show you real quick the Blazor improvements that we've added in here. And I've got, I've got a sample project that I've been working on um, that I can show this where we're taking advantage of some of that. This is, not that one. This is a project that, that is based off of a discussion that I've been having with, uh, with my friend Dan Roth, who's the program manager for Blazor, about what if we made Blazor components, Razor components for ASP.NET Core that were using the same names and had the same features as those that we had for web forms. If we do that, you might be able, might be able to take advantage of having the same markup from web forms all the way through to Blazor. Be able to lift your web forms markup and uh, refactor it slightly, maybe a little find and replace, and drop it into Blazor and it potentially could work if we had the same names and the same features. That'd be pretty valuable. So what we've done is we've started building out um, things like a list view. This is the first one of these that we built where we have a list view that outputs a table and if we have an empty data, we have an empty data template, we have a header and we have item templates that we're gonna drop into the middle of this. So we've got generic templates for our project, for our component that we can populate with whatever we, we need but I have now a partial class that goes with that markup that defines, well, here's the items that I'm receiving for this, t for this component. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm delegating, I'm hiding a data source property here that's gonna dump into that same items uh, property. Items is a very blazer way to reference the data in the component, but data source is the way we used to do that in web forms. Right, and, and then, gosh, in web forms, we would always call data bind. But data bind isn't really a thing inside of Blazor. So if you do still call data bind, I'm gonna mark that as obsolete and throw a message there. But I can use this template, this, this component, as a list view here, and I'm even including the old run at equals server. It's ignoring it, it doesn't know what to do with that, but we're just gonna carry that along. Um, and I've specified the type of object I'm gonna output. I've got a layout template that specifies here's what it's gonna look like, and I've got an item template that specifies here, uh, here is how I'm gonna format things. So this library that I'm building, this isn't something, this isn't something part of Blazor and 3.1, but the way that we formatted this component as a partial class, and we're able to receive some of these generic objects and interact with them, and we can even, receive a, um, right, I can set up a constructor parameter up here, right, and receive something here, I don't know. That's now legit, you can receive some sort of an input parameter and act on it, and I've just made up iFoo. But you can now use that to build and interact with things inside of your components. So when you think about Blazor components and how you're gonna deploy these, you could have a component that runs on the server and you can have one that runs in WebAssembly. If you're connecting into a database or you're connecting into a, a service to get your bank rates, 
Well, the way that you do that connection when you're in the client running out on somebody's phone out in the field, they don't have direct access to what's behind the firewall in your data center. So you won't be able to query the database directly. You're gonna have to go through an API endpoint like our gRPC service we saw. So to be able to put an interface here and inject into our component the appropriate connection mechanism is kind of important. And now you can do that with Blazor. Really cool stuff that we're, we're happy to be able to share with you and um, I hope works very well for you if you try and work with Blazor. We have a complete workshop available for you that's called the Build Your Own Pizza Store User Interface with Blazor. You can get access to the source code for this. You can get access to my video. I spent six hours talking about this on YouTube, walking through this whole process. If you wanna learn more about building components with this and, and you wanna build some interesting pizzas here, like the bacon Naderizer that has every type of bacon, buffalo chicken, that's a pretty good pizza. Don't get the Brit. I'm not gonna back that one up. Bacon cheese, basic cheese pizza, that's the one my kids like. Check it out bit.ly slash fritzblazer2019 and you'll get access to my video and uh, the source code that we used to build this. Walk through the entire thing for you. It's a video on YouTube. It's about six hours long. So uh, take your time going through it. Really good stuff. So I mentioned this was the LTS release of .NET Core. .NET Core 3.1 just released. This is the long-term support version. So it will be supported for three years. You will have until December 2022 to run with .NET Core 3.1. .NET Core 3.0, because it was a current release, will pause support, uh, I think it's, it's sometime it's like March, I think is when that support runs up. But we have new versions coming. .NET 5, we're, we have scheduled for release in November 2020. There'll be major releases every year and there will be long-term support for the even numbered releases. So right now, um, .NET Core 2.1 is a long-term servicing release and that was released in 2018. That's gonna continue to be supported as an LTS release until 2021. .NET Core 3.1 will be till 2022. And before those two arrive, .NET 6 will be available and that will be a version that will have long-term support. We want to make sure that you have this predictable schedule and can take the minor release versions if you want them. You have the ability to opt into current releases if that makes sense for you and your organization. We want to make the transition between these versions of .NET as seamless as possible so that you get the support you need to be able to build the applications you want at the pace you want as well. Um, there's a comment, there's a question in the chat room from, um, is this device railway 845 asks, I don't hear good things about ASP.NET MVC. How is Razor? ASP.NET MVC is still very much available. Folks enjoy building with the model view controller capabilities and that architecture. You're more than welcome to incur to continue using that. We think that's um, a, a very dependable architecture and framework that you can use. It's going to continue to be supported and um, it's, it's not going anywhere. We, we think that there's still some growth that can happen in there, and we're gonna continue to, to build for it. So, all right. Um, Blazor WebAssembly, May 2020 is when we expect to release that. Some links for you, so you can get started with ASP.NET Core, download it at dot.net, get your favorite version of Visual Studio at visualstudio.com. All of our docs, they're updated continuously, and they're open source. So if you see something you wanna help with, you wanna help clarify, docs, .asp.net, and that'll route you through to docsmicrosoft.com and the appropriate ASP.NET location. Blazor, everything about this framework to get you started, the down, uh, downloads, templates, uh, run times, all the stuff for WebAssembly version is there as well at blazor.net. The workshop, the source code for the workshop, you can find at aka.ms slash blazor workshop. And um, you can find me everywhere. Yeah, the, my name is already over there on the other side. I am C Sharp Fritz on YouTube, on GitHub, on Twitter, on Instagram, on, I'm not on TikTok. Do I need to get on TikTok? Is that a thing? That's called hitting the post. That's what we call that in radio. My name is Jeff Fritz. Thank you so much for, for having me here. And I have a question. 
in the chat room. Are the full framework versions going to be supported? Asks Eternal Dev Coder. Um, that, well, that's right. Um, they all become .NET 5 next year. That's right. So um, we did support the full framework versions of .NET Core, all the ASP.NET Core capabilities. You can run those on top of the full .NET framework. That works only through, I think it's ASP.NET Core 2.2. Uh, it might be 2.1, but it, it will not be supported going forward with ASP.NET Core 3, but everything gets converted to .NET 5 next year. So you, you have a little bit of overlap there. I don't see any more questions in the chat room. Any questions here in the room? How are you going from 3 to 5? I'm sorry? How are you going from 3 to 5? Why are we going from 3 to 5? Well, the Windows folks went from 8 to 10, so we figured we could do it too, right? No. Um, honestly, there was enough confusion and enough SEO issue around ASP.NET 4, 4 dot this, 4 dot that. If we called it, if we called it .NET 4 dot something, while that's the current version that we support for .NET framework, it would be really confusing. So by kind of merging the numbers and saying, you know what, we're at 3 for .NET Core, we're at 4, 8 for .NET framework. If we're gonna merge the two and have, and have Xamarin come along for the ride and have all the features for everything, and, or one .NET to rule them all. Um, let's just jump right to five. I think that it, it kind of makes sense. So, yes, another question here. So, what about Azure functions for .NET Core 3.0 or 3.1? Um, we are deploying. They were deploying the runtime to uh, Azure App Service yesterday, I think they started, and they should be done today, tomorrow. Um, but for Azure Functions, I don't think they support the 3.0 runtime or the 3.1 runtime yet. They're still in preview with the various features. And with the new language features that are coming along, there's some things they wanna make sure they get right for Azure Functions. So they're still in preview. I don't know the exact run, uh, delivery date that they expect to be completed that, but it is something they're actively working on. Um, let's see here, is this, for, oh my gosh, it's hard to read, it's so small. I wanna make sure I come to the other questions that I have here in chat. Let me go over to my other view here. There we go, so now everybody can see chat over, it's over here, over there. Furvent T90 says, pretty happy to see me doing what I do the way I'm doing it, Th congrats. Well, thank you so much, uh, Furvent 90 I appreciate that. Paul Wart Moldka, uh, okay, is that somebody in the room? No, okay. Well, thanks so much, folks. I appreciate you having me here. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this works over here on Twitch so we could share that with our folks watching around the world. We had, uh, we had 50 to 70 folks watching throughout the, uh, the evening here. Um, but it was great to be able to, to share a little bit of what's happening here in Arizona with the folks out there on Twitch. Thank you so much. This video, like all my other videos, is recorded. It's available on Twitch right now, but we'll send it over to YouTube and you'll find it on the YouTube channel if you want to check it out later. Thanks so much. There you go. Look at this. Say hello. We, we've got folks coming in from Spain. Uh, chat room, can you sound off and let us know where you're dialed in from so we can kind of share with our friends here in Arizona where some of you are connecting in from. Kim, I think, uh, Australia, yeah, Canada. There we go. Downtown Canada, right? Serbia, right? Folks watching from all over the place. It's really great to be able to share with folks outside of, outside the states from the UK, Poland, Brisbane, yeah, yeah, yeah. Austria, there you go. So thank you so much. All right. So, there's still food left? Okay. Bald bearded builder is outside my house. No, you're not in my house, Kim Philpott. Ugh. <laughs>